like to greet you once again, dear friends, to J. Vernon McGee's commentary on the Gospel of Matthew. Today we'll begin the study of chapter 6, which is a continuation of Christ's revolutionary Sermon on the Mount. Now the important thing to note in this chapter is that it speaks of the relationship of the subjects of the Kingdom of Heaven to God Himself. In other words, it covers the inner motives that govern our external acts of righteousness such as the giving of alms or charity, prayer, fasting, and the pursuit of riches. These are all a part of the Christian's relationship to God. And they also play a very important part in the life of God's children, by the way. So this part of the Sermon of the Mount deals with the externalities of religion. Remember that in chapter 5 I said that so many Christians today boast about living according to the Sermon on the Mount, when in reality they're doing nothing of the sort. And you can prove that by going to any of their churches and attempt to get some financial help from their rich members, and then seeing how far you get. You won't get very far, I assure you. So the reality is that they don't live by it. They just think it's a great document on moral living. Of course, they love to hear about it in church every Sunday. But come Monday, it's back to cold-blooded business and cash on the barrel head or you don't get anything. But this is where the rubber hits the road, folks. When we put Christ's Sermon on the Mount into real life action and not just think about it as a wonderful subject for a Sunday morning sermon. And you'll also remember that in chapter 5, the Lord says, Be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And now here in chapter 6, the king speaks of the practical righteousness that his subjects must possess. To be perfect, we need a righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, who had a great religious righteousness and openly boasted about it. But true righteousness comes to us only through complete trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it changes our motives from what we can do for ourselves to what we can do for God. No third party can enter into this relationship. This relationship is between our soul and God. First, our Lord talks about alms or acts of righteousness, which are an externality or ostentation. That is things that you do in a religious way. And notice here that the Lord says, take heed that you do not do your alms or acts of righteousness before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So our giving should be only between us and God. We shouldn't be giving in a way that people can see us doing it. And the Lord uses very strong language here. When you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the street to be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have already received their reward. The Lord says this with abiding irony, with a rapier of sarcasm which he knew how to use very well. You see, the Pharisees had a custom when they wanted to give to the poor, they'd go down to a busy street in Jerusalem and blow a trumpet. And the original purpose of this was to call the poor and the needy together to receive the gifts. But it also afforded a very fine opportunity to let other people in the neighborhood know how generous they were. Can you see any parallel with certain Christians and philanthropists today? But Jesus says when the Pharisees do it that way, they already have their reward. You'll ask here, well, what exactly is their reward? Well, what is it that they are after? They did it to be seen and glorified by the people. And they made very certain that they would be seen by the people because they blew a loud trumpet and everybody in the neighborhood came running out to see how generously they gave. And that was their reward. It wasn't between them and God at all. How do we give, friends? There's more than one way to give. They say that people see the deed, but God sees the motive. Several years ago, I was asked to take an offering for a certain organization. I was told that what I needed to do was to give everybody an opportunity to stand up in front of everyone and declare how much they were going to give. But they told me to begin by asking, now how many of you will give a hundred dollars? I asked them, why in the world would you do it like that? 
and they told me that there was a certain man there who would donate only one dollar if a regular offering was taken. But if you gave him the opportunity to stand up and announce before everyone that he would give a hundred dollars, he would give exactly that amount. May I say here that he blew a trumpet? And later I got to know the man more closely and learned that this is exactly how he always gave. And then there are other people who like to give large checks, but they always want to hand them to you personally. There once was a man in my church who always gave me a check just before I would enter into the pulpit. He thought that this would excite me enough that I would make a mention of his generosity before the whole congregation. Then one day a friend of his came to me and said, Mr. So-and-so is quite upset. He gave you a check last Sunday, and you didn't get up and acknowledge it. I told him, that's right, and here's the reason why. I said, your friend is a man of means, and that check he gave me, in relation to what he has, wasn't very much. You see, last Sunday, a mail carrier also handed me an envelope, but he didn't want me to open it up until after the service, or say a word about it to anyone and he gave me almost twice as much money as your man of means did. Let me tell you, if I'm going to acknowledge anyone at all, it would have to be that mail carrier. But he didn't want me to do that. So let me tell you that giving is between you and God. And the moment you get a third party involved, you don't get any credit in heaven where it counts the most. There's a lot of so-called Christian giving that really isn't giving at all. For example, the college I graduated from also liked to play on this human weakness. While I was in school, beautiful architectural plans were drawn up for a tower to be added to an old hall on the campus. And the college administrators announced that the tower would be named after a donor. And not surprisingly, about half a dozen donors appeared who wanted their names on that tower. And today that building is called So-and-So Tower in honor of a certain man who gave a donation for its construction. And his name is still there, carved in stone, which means that his trumpet will be blowing for as long as that tower is standing. And a lot of people give like that. But that kind of giving is worth nothing to God. But when you give to the needy, the Lord says, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. So the Lord is saying, don't reach into your pocket with one hand and then put your other hand into the air to let people know how much you're giving. He says that when you put your hand into your pocket in order to get something to give, you should be so thoroughly secretive about it that even your other hand is not aware of what you're doing. Then the Lord speaks about another form of religious ostentation that can be abused. Let's read about it in verse 5. And when you pray, do not be as the hypocrites, for they love to pray in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by the people. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward. So don't be like the hypocrites. My, the Lord uses strong language here, doesn't he? And he says that these hypocrites pray to be seen by the people. Many of the religious people in those days walked around wearing a prayer shawl, which advertises the fact that they were praying. Jesus says here that when someone prays like that, they already have their reward, because what they wanted was to be seen and admired by the people. So they get that reward, but their prayer doesn't rise above the rafters of the building. But when you pray, Jesus says, go into your room, close the door after you, and pray to your Father who is not seen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. That is, he'll answer your prayer. Now, there's another revolutionary concept that we're dealing with here. Did you notice that the Lord uses the term Father? These can only be the citizens of God's kingdom that he's talking about here. And how do you become a citizen of God's kingdom, that is, a child of God, today? Well, his house, says the Apostle John. And to all who receive him, that is, Jesus, he gave the authority to become the children of God, even to them that do no more or no less 
than believe in his name. Many say nowadays, well, I'm already a very spiritual person. But the Lord said even to the spiritual leader of Israel, Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you have to be born again. You have to receive God's Son. And then, and only then, will you have the right to call God your Father. Now in the Old Testament, you will not find the word Father used in relation to people and God. God does refer to the nation of Israel as a whole, saying that Israel is my son, but he does not say that of any individual Israelite. So the Lord Jesus is speaking here of a new relationship between us and God. And concerning the subject of prayer, we're told that it should be secret and sincere. And I tell you that many an unknown saint will be revealed to everyone as a great minister of prayer at the judgment seat of Christ. Let's read further. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. I heard a fellow pray the other day, and I countered that he repeated his petition about a dozen times. But the Lord says that if we ask the Father even once, he does hear us. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need even before you ask him. So the marks of genuine prayer are, first of all, sincerity. That means you don't go around making a public show of it, but you go into your room, quietly close the door, and pray, so that your prayer is only between you and God. Secondly, our prayers should be simple. Don't go and wax eloquent with vain repetitions, but get right down to the nitty-gritty and tell the Lord exactly what you have on your mind because your Father knows what you need, even before you ask Him. But that doesn't mean He doesn't want us to express our needs to Him. He still wants us to come to Him and ask Him personally. So in conclusion now, when you have a need, and we all do, bring it to God privately and sincerely. And don't forget to give Him thanks for what He's already given you. As the Apostle Paul writes to the Philippian church, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What a great thought to close with. May God bless you with positive results as you put these principles into action. And please revisit this channel for part two of J. Vernon McGee's commentary on chapter six of this remarkable book. Mm